my name is Michael Hübner. Um, I'm speaking here from Austria, Vienna. I'm working at the Austrian Ministry of Transport, Innovation and Technology. Thank you, Fernando, for this introduction of our today's webinar. Um, we welcome a, a big number of participants. Meanwhile, as I see here on the screen, it's already 104 participants connecting. Um, and we are very happy that we have this large interest for, for this webinar. Um, to briefly introduce myself a little bit more, so I'm working in Austria in the field of innovation for energy technologies. Um, working at the Austrian Ministry, I'm responsible for developing um, strategic st strategies and funding programs for smart energy systems, smart grids, and energy technologies. I'm working on a European level as uh, a co-chair of uh, a member states working group in the set plan action four on energy systems and networks. I will explain in a minute what what this exactly is, and uh, I'm chairing. Um, a national stakeholders coordination group in the framework of ETIPS SNET, as uh, Fernando has explained before. I'm coordinating a network of 30 funding institutions, public funding institutions in 25 European countries that are working together and financing projects together. This is called ERANET Smart Energy Systems. I'm coordinating this initiative and I'm also working on an international uh, global level, uh, for example, as uh, the Austrian representative in the International Smart Grid Action Network, ISGAP. Um, my job today is to very briefly uh, introduce you a little bit in the framework that we are working in here. This framework is called the European Strategic Technology Plan. The SAT plan is, you could say, briefly, the technology pillar of the European energy and climate policy. It was adopted by the European Union in 2008, um, and it wants to establish an uh, um, energy technology policy network for Europe. Um, its goals are accelerating knowledge development, technology transfer, and uptake all over Europe in cooperation of, the, of all the European uh, countries and member states, maintaining the European industrial leadership on low carbon, carbon energy technologies, fostering science for transforming energy technologies to achieve the 2020 energy and climate goals that we have formulated in Europe uh, and contributing to the worldwide transition to a low carbon economy with a perspective of 2050. Um, in this framework of the European SEF plan, we have defined 10 key actions. They were written down more or less and agreed on in 2015. 15, and a number, a huge number of industry stakeholders and member states have has committed to uh, this uh, to these key actions in what we call here declarations of inter intent. And you can see here a little bit the, the topics of these 10 key actions. They are dealing, of course, with renew renewables, with consumers in the energy system, uh, with efficiency in the energy system, sustainable transport, carbon capture and utilization and storage, and nuclear safety. Um, this webinar was born more or less in the framework of the Zeppelin key action number four, which is called resiliency and security of the energy system. And um, the topics that we are discussing in this um, key action are very much related to energy systems and networks, smart energy digitalization um, of energy systems and networks.
So you can see here a little bit an outline of key topics. So it's about smart solutions for energy consumers, integrated and flexible energy systems. It's about how can we engage the consumers, how can we develop smart technologies and services for the consumers. It also includes the initiatives on smart cities and communities. It's about modernizing the electricity grid, building synergies with other energy networks like heating networks on the local and regional level or with gas networks and so on. Of course, one of the key topics nowadays is to develop and integrate energy storage. And one key question, of course, is how to, how to flexibly uh, how to flexibilize the system um, while maintaining the security of the system. On my slide, you find a link. Uh, I, I, I think it will not work in the presentation here, but I don't know how it is provided to uh, more information on set plan action four. I will only, and I apologize for this uh, rather complex graph. I just want to show you that in this landscape of the SEPLAN Action 4, uh, there have formed um, a number of working groups and groups that are trying to implement what we call the implementation plan of the SEPLAN Action 4 that we have developed. I will speak the, about this in a minute. Uh, and the message that I want to give here is that member states, European member states, are working very intensely together in a working group that you see here on the on the right side in this in this yellow uh, box, the member states working group on action four. They are putting together money in Aeronet smart energy systems that I have already been briefly talking about um, to fund projects. On the on the left or in the, in the center of the picture, you see the ETIP-SNET governing board. This is an initiative that is industry-led and is really uh, gathering key industries in Europe that are dealing with this topic and that are active in this topic, um, that are committed to implement uh, the the set plan in this in this in this field, and they are also forming working groups with a number of experts from industries in Europe. This all together with the European Commission and all other industry initiatives that you can see on the left hand side on PV, on renewable heating and cooling, on geothermal and so on, all this together is forming what we call the European Technology and Innovation Platform on Smart Networks for the energy transition. Member states and the industry being active in this field and together we have last year, or no, beginning of this year, um, concluded on what we call the Action for Implementation Plan. And here you see here that mainly this action plan, uh, this implementation plan is gathering around two key topics. One is the flagship initiative on developing an optimized European power grid. The other um, flagship initiative number two is about developing integrated local and regional energy systems. Um, and both of these flagship initiatives, of course, are complementing each other and very closely linked to each other, but are showing more or less two parts of the medal uh, that we are talking about when we want to innovate the energy networks. We have defined a number of um, innovation activities that you see here grouped around these two flagship initiatives. Um, and of course, there are some cross-cutting initiatives. And one of the cross-cutting topics that came up in the discussion was definitely about how can we innovate not only the technology, but also our uh, regulatory and legal frameworks that um, in a way that they are um, supporting the development and the change maybe even more as they do it today. And this is exactly the topic that we are going to deal uh, with today. We started um, a discussion in the National Stakeholders Coordination Group meeting 
um, we had half a year ago uh, in Amsterdam, and that was so interesting that um, we thought it would be worthwhile to bring that to elaborate much more on these topics um, in form of this webinar. And therefore, I'm very happy that we can be together here. I'm stopping here. I just want to um, announce two other upcoming events that are dealing with other innovation activities in the framework of this implementation plan of the SEP Plan Action 4. One is a workshop on PV self-consumption, an internet national exchange of R&D projects, and living labs that are dealing with the idea how can we optimize our PV uh, self usage um, from from the from the PV that we are uh, that we are uh, producing from, and this is uh, contributing to, as you see here, uh, the innovation action 2.25. And then um, another upcoming stakeholder event is a symposium on interoperability. And they are providing and pre preparing a connectathon uh, on energy, trying to bring people together that really practically want to link their devices, smart grid devices, and let them uh, enable them to speak to each other. So this is another event that that comes on in, up in, uh, in a little bit more in the future, beginning of next year. But there will be a number of other activities, and we will try to put that information together and keep you updated when you are interested. Thank you very much uh, for this possibility to introduce this webinar today. And now we are very interested to hear our speakers that will go into the topic of regulatory innovation zones um, or sandboxes, as we call them. Um, and I'm giving back to Fernando Nuno uh, from the Copper Institute. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for this uh, good introduction. I will give now the floor to uh, Fernando Garcia. Fernando, let me know if uh, you have the control over the slides, or should I go to them? Hi, Fernando. No, I don't see the presentation, so I will ask you to, to pass the, the, the slides. So thank you okay, for that. Some so, technical points. <laughs> OK, so we are on the first slide showing the okay. picture. Only thank first you. is only to to introduce myself. I'm Fernando Garcia. I, come, I work in Naturgy as an international energy company based in Madrid. And uh, I will collaborate very closely to the Futuroed, that this is the, the technology the technology platform, the Spanish technology platform with markets, and so with the TPS net with Michael in the main same group of Michael. So first, I would like to introduce the goals of the meeting, but I would like to make a picture of what we are going to talk about in this uh, session. Normally, market is the source where innovation presents starts, challenges, restrictions, opportunities in the real life are the origin of new ideas. You know, this innovation can end in, the, in, the, in a product, in a, in a new service, a new product that can teach the, the market under his established rules. For example, if we're talking about a new equipment with more efficient that replaces the older one, so it's a normal process where market innovation works together without nothing more than that. You can go to the next round of this. But uh, when uh, we need some innovations that uh, changes the relations and the functions between some uh, stakeholders talking in the energy field. Uh, this change is not so easy to implement into the market. So sometimes we need a collaboration with the regulatory body or the regulatory organization that need to participate in the path of the innovation. And like that, he can test different uh, business models and to see the efficiency of these models before the implementation of the new rules. That is not, so, not, not an easy task. The first slide, please. There are different mechanisms to do this process that has been tested in the past. But uh, in this session, we are going to see a, a very new mechanism that is not so spread. So it, it, is, it was started in the fintech uh, industry in order to test new solutions in the banking. But now he's moving to other sectors. And energy is starting to test this mechanism. And we are going to see uh, how it works in the, in the presentation in this session. Uh, this is we are talking about the sandbox innovation or regulatory sandboxes or regulatory innovation uh, uh, zones. 
this correlation between market innovation and regulation uh, uh, precedes the acceleration of the adoption of new and more efficient solutions that will help us to meet the goals of the energy transition in the end. So if we move to the next slide, uh, uh, this is how it was started the process of this uh, conference. Uh, we are starting a meeting of this in the third National Stakeholder Coordination Group meeting in Malmo, in Sweden, uh, in May this year. So there, uh, there we, we started to talk about this concept, and we uh, think that it would be good to present in a weather, uh, wider way uh, in, in this um, session, um, session, and we have prepared two webinars. Uh, one with uh, UK, Netherlands, and Germany. They're going to present a real operating uh, sandboxes with uh, real uh, projects that are working on, on the on the these rules on this sandbox concept. And we are preparing another another uh, regulatory another webinar for October uh, to be uh, done in October. The basic objective of that is to, to spread the knowledge of this new technology, this new, this new methodology, in order to spread and to accelerate the adoption of new uh, solutions like this one in other uh, countries, or even to uh, get the best practices of this uh, first implementation of sandboxes to uh, get better sandboxes in the future. And the end, last slide, to, to further work we were thinking is to go deeper in this sandbox mechanism and to start a work correlating with this, between this action uh, related by by Michael in the action set action plan implementation plan the regulatory innovation zones with the ISGAM Academy from the International Energy Agency. The idea is to go deeper in this analysis of mechanism of sandboxes and to extract the, 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 the how did they work the best practices the guidelines and to promote others to take this mechanism and implement in the in the country. So I'm very glad also to know the big number of uh, persons or, or people that have been registered in the in the um, in the webinar. And it was something that is interesting that even we if we have started that as a European uh, webinar, the the amount of, of people that come from the other countries, uh, I have seen 70 countries represented in the in the webinar. So uh, I think it's very interesting that it's a very generic, generic and, and worldwide um, uh, interest. Uh, anyway, the energy transition is not only for Europe, it's for the world. So I'm very, very happy to, if we can promote some new ideas to, to support this energy transition worldwide. So that's all. It's very brief introduction of the goals, and I think the, I would like to, to continue the real uh, sandbox explanation. Very good, Fernando. Fernando. Thank you very much for your intervention. And now uh, we'll give the floor to uh, Daniel. So, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm very aware that I'm speaking to a mixture of people, some of whom maybe are from the UK or Europe and know Ofgem really well. Others from other parts of the world maybe don't know us at all. So I'll try and come to some balance in terms of what I say and how much I explain. So for those of you who don't know Ofgem, we're the energy regulator in the UK. We both help make some of the regulation and enforce some of the regulation. And uh, so we have a key role in, in making sure that the markets work well and making sure that energy consumers are protected both today and that we meet the interests of future consumers. We've been running a, a sandbox for a couple of years. We set up a team called the Innovation Link. And I really want to talk to you about the two things that we do in the Innovation Link, the two services we offer, the sandbox and our other service, which is the feedback service. And I think it's important to understand the, the interaction between these two services and, and how we make them work together. So we run these two services. And that's our way of making sure that Ofgem is part of the solution to helping with innovation rather than part of the problem um, in terms of blocking innovation. We know it's very important for us in order to, to make sure that we meet goals for today and future consumers that Ofgem are part of the solution to helping innovation. As well as offering these services to innovators, we gather information for Ofgem policy teams so that when we're making longer term policy decisions, we have a really good understanding of what's going on in the market. And that's incredibly helpful for us. 
can someone, uh, one of the other presenters, tell me, can you hear me clearly? I can okay. hear you very clearly, Michael is here. Great, thank you. I'll carry on, at least now I know. Great, ah, thank you everyone for responding on the, on the chat, great. So, uh, the first thing, our fast frank feedback service. So, this is the first thing that we did when we set up the team. And we, what we said is, if you're an innovator and you're looking to launch a new product or a service in the energy sector, we know that the energy regulation can be confusing. Now, historically, Ofgem had been very reluctant to give people definite guidance to help them interpret the regulation, because, of course, this is a big burden on us and it creates the possibility that maybe we, we say the wrong thing um, and something can go wrong. But we also realized that this isn't so helpful. So in our team, we created a new compromise where we said, actually, my team are prepared to go out and try and uh, understand from within our organization what the answer to your question is. If you want to know, can you launch in a new energy supplier in the UK, and maybe you only supply older people, you're only interested in, in, in supplying older people, are you allowed to do that? And we will come back and we'll say, this is only our informal guidance, but our, our guidance from my personal understanding as your case manager is, uh, no, I don't think that's okay for, for this reason, or maybe yes, it is okay. And often what we're able to help uh, people do is they come wanting to do one thing, we find that there's maybe some difficulty, but we can guide them to a way that it's possible for them to go ahead. And that service has been incredibly successful. We, we really started this as an experiment, and this was started two years ago before I joined, and it's been a wonderful thing to join because it's really been the organization saying, we want to just try some things, and we don't know whether or not this is going to meet a need. But rather than discussing it, we're just going to try offering it. And we're going to see the reaction, and then we're going to test and learn and evolve these services as we go. So it's been wonderful being involved in such a proactive test and learn approach. And what we learned around the feedback service is that, yes, there is a really clear demand. Lots of people approached us. Lots of people asked us for, for our feedback. And they came with a very broad variety of different ideas. They also came from a, a big variety of different backgrounds. Big companies already in the industry. Small startups just started with one or two people. Maybe big organizations from other, um, other uh, industries that you wouldn't think were looking at doing something in energy. And we learned so much. I think we have an amazing view from this of all of the different innovations that people are looking to try in the UK energy sector. And our satisfaction is very high as well. When we ask people how they rate the service, um, they come back very good. Um, we know that uh, there's uh, one person on our survey said they were dissatisfied. We, we uh, tried to understand why that was. And it, it turns out that the key barrier is because we're giving this informal advice, we're not publishing something that we want uh, to go out to the whole market. There's going to be a difficulty because people want to be able to share the, the feedback we give them. And we ask them not to do that. We say, please come back to us individually. Uh, but other than that, the overall picture is very, very good. So let me now move on to our sandbox service, which we started a little bit later, where we try and lighten the regulation for people who want to run a trial. And so we offer a time-limited lightening of the regulation that we control, or we offer some interpretation and in this case, unlike with the feedback service, we say, if we tell you that what you're doing is OK, then for two years, this is definitely the answer from the regulator, and we won't change this answer. Um, what we found is that there was actually some confusion as to what a sandbox is. Um, and so we wanted to clarify that it's not a change to the regulation permanently. Uh, and it's also not us saying that we think that your business is a good idea. So, so far we opened the sandbox 
so two windows. We, we um, gave two periods where people could apply. And we got 80 applications. Um, and what happened is that most people who applied, uh, we found it was really interesting that they actually didn't need a sandbox. We learned uh, the, the way that people understand what they can do in the industry is they look around at other people, their competitors, and they ask their partners, maybe they ask a consultant, and they decide, you know, if something doesn't look possible, if someone else isn't doing it, probably it's not possible in the regulation. And so the regulation is, is big, it's complex, uh, so they don't actually look at the rule book itself. So lots of people came to us wanting a sandbox uh, in order to be able to go ahead, and we were able to say to them, uh, yeah, actually, you don't need a sandbox. Uh, you can just go ahead anyway. Um, we ended up offering seven sandbox trials so far, uh, and they're all quite early still. Um, and we learned from this a lot about the barriers that we see people coming up against in the regulation, and um, what technologies people are working with, and what kind of new propositions people want to work with. We also saw, as we see on this webinar now, that there's a lot of interest in the sandbox. Often when I go to conferences in the UK, I hear one or two other speakers mention the sandbox, and we get contacted um, to take part in, in webinars and conferences like this, and we get contacted by governments and regulators from around the world, the Philippines, Japan, uh, uh, Australia, all sorts of uh, different people come to us. Uh, so let me tell you about a specific case. Um, and looking at this photo, this is in a town in the north of England um, in, in Nottingham, um, the, uh, where there's a new development. It's been built by uh, a developer who have a, a social and environmental commitment, and they really want to make it a showcase for new ways of, uh, uh, of people consuming electricity in a more sustainable way. So what they do here uh, is they already have solar installed, uh, and they already have a huge tester battery um, that I, I've been out to see. Um, and they wanted to put in place demand response appliances and other ways that, pe that the people living there could be able to consume uh, energy more sustainably and use more of the, the locally produced energy themselves. And they also wanted to trial a different way of people buying this energy. So when they originally came to us, they said they want to sell the energy that is locally produced directly to people. And then when energy uh, is not available locally, then they could buy it from a normal energy supplier, an energy retailer, as any consumer in the UK normally would. And what we ended up working with them to create is an arrangement whereby a, a local energy services company called ESCO, uh, so a local small community organization, would build a customer both for the energy that they buy locally and for the energy that they're buying from the grid from a, a normal supplier. So the customer still receives one simple bill, but rather than it being from uh, a big nationwide energy company, both their local energy and the rest of their energy needs all come together on this one bill from a local um, organization the community is involved in running. And that ordinarily would, uh, was something that people were not sure how to do in the regulation. So the focus of the sandbox was helping them to, to be able to do that. So what we learned from this, as I started to, to cover before, is that businesses are actually unclear about what they can and can't do. And we had this image of people coming to us and saying, we know that this rule, section 22, uh, paragraph A, says that we can't do this trial. Please, will you help relax this rule? And actually, it wasn't like that. People came to us with an assumption that there would be uh, a rule that blocked them when often that wasn't true. Um, the, uh, 
but we then saw that what we needed to do is to invest much more time than we'd expected working with companies to be able to shape a trial that was possible in the regulation and, and work for, for them. We saw that for the remaining organizations where there is a block to them going ahead, also the off-gems rules are not the only rules that can block them. So the situation in the UK is that you have our rules. We offer licenses to energy suppliers and other organizations. And there are also other industry codes. And the industry codes and the, the technical systems and just the industry practices often come together around the current way that everybody understands things are going to work. So when you try and do something that no one had imagined doing, you often find there's not one rule, but a whole complex set of things stopping you going ahead. And some of those we don't directly control. In fact, many of those we don't directly control. And so it's not so simple as us just being able to turn that off to facilitate a trial. Again, leading back to um, there being more work to do on enabling trials for each of the ones that went ahead. Uh, than, than we had originally expected, a very valuable thing for us to learn. We did, in, uh, in this specific case, find that where you have a, a licensed energy supplier in the UK and a small community energy company, that they can work together, and that it's often possible to do something together that they can't do separately. That's a, a specific lesson around these kind of community energy projects like the one I just described. We learned that a lot of people who approached us for the, for the sandbox, one of the key things that they wanted is to be able to go back to potential investors and say that they've spoken to us and that we confirm that their business does not have any barriers, that it's something that the investor can invest money in and know that it won't be blocked by the regulation now in the future. And that's not what the sandbox was intended to offer. And so it's a need we really recognize. Uh, and we, we're really sympathetic to the need by companies to raise funding, but it's a challenge for us to be able to meet that need. So that's something we need to carry on thinking about. And we also went out saying that we want to offer time-limited trials for up to two years. And we found that, of course, really understandably, businesses don't necessarily want to run trials. What they want is to be able to launch a business and run it forever. So for them, the question of what's going to happen at the end of this two-year period is, of course, really important. And that's a challenge to the way that we've thought about the sandbox as well. So um, because of this, we're now looking at how we, we go forward with the sandbox. We've seen that it's really popular. So of course, it's something that we remain really committed to carrying on doing. And with one of the challenges that I mentioned before, where we said that there are industry codes, a thing called the Balancing and Settlement Code is one of the key ones, um, we've already got a joint venture with Alexon, who, who run that code in the UK. And so we're going to have extra tool in the sandbox. So when people come to us, we're going to be able to help them not just with our regulation, but also some other areas of the industry codes as well. So the sandbox will become broader. And so we've already started moving it so that it more closely meets the needs that people actually have. So I think that's everything I wanted to say. You have our team email address here if there are people um, who want to contact us, particularly if you're looking to do anything in the UK. We're very interested to hear from you. Great. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this interesting case study. So now it's uh, time for Albert to introduce um, his case study. So Albert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, I will discuss today, uh, from a legal perspective, uh, the problems with uh, experiments in Sandbox and solutions to it. Um, I'm Albert Jan van Veldhuizen. I'm from the ATM, the Dutch regulator for energy. Uh, and besides that, we're also doing uh, consumer authority, uh, competition authority, and telecom and postal. But for today, it's uh, it's about energy. Um, so I will 
I'm going to give you some examples of experiments we have seen and we have discussed with the TSOs and DSOs. And in order to explain you what the problems are uh, we encounter and which kind of solutions we have, uh, I have to give you a little legal background. And uh, I think in the Netherlands it's probably the same as in quite a lot of other uh, countries as far as I know. Uh, first, we have the electricity law, which uh, dictates what uh, TSOs and DSO uh, may do and may not do. Uh, of course, it's decided on with some democratic legislature at the parliament, and we have also some European law above it, so it also should respect European law. So that's uh, something. But then the ACM, as regulator, also has some uh, own decisions, uh, the national net codes. Uh, in the national net codes, they are uh, mostly proposed by the TSOs and DSO itself. The net codes, uh, for the ones that are not familiar with that, they actually describe the, uh, what the TSOs and DSOs can offer to uh, customers, to consumers. Um, the TSOs and DSOs, they propose it themselves to the ACM, and uh, based on electricity law, the ACM can decide whether they agree or not agree on the change of the, ne uh, the net codes. But since, of course, the ACM is not a democratic uh, uh, entity, it's open for appeal at, at the court uh, if you don't uh, agree with the decision. Um, so it's still covered by the electricity law. Um, in electricity law, also, it stated that a party may request a derogation of the net code. Uh, that should be the case if it's a specific and temporary uh, case, uh, which uh, is not allowed by the net code, but still fulfills the, uh, the assumptions made by the electricity law. Uh, so that's the power of the ACM to uh, give parties the right to not oblige the net code, but still, everybody still has to oblige the electri electricity law. So it means that the ACM cannot give, cannot give a derogation of the electricity law, only of the net code itself. Uh, by deciding so, uh, the ACM uh, uh, thinks especially about the uh, uh, customers and consumers. Uh, they are right, since uh, yeah, the monopoly uh, TSOs and DSOs uh, uh, find some counterbalance uh, with ACM for protection of uh, consumers and, and customers. Uh, by the way, I use consumers and customers uh, in the same meaning. It's both uh, uh, industry as uh, households. So what I want to discuss, uh, and depending on the time, I will discuss two or three of them. Uh, we have, uh, last one and a half year, we have had four different uh, experiments proposed by DSOs, so the regional the distribution system operations, the one that actually uh, put electricity and gas towards the end users. Um, and I will go directly into the first. It's just a list of the four. The first uh, proposition we got was uh, one DSO wants to actually make a direct current uh, uh, distribution network. Um, as you all know, uh, our normal electricity is uh, alternating current, AC, but if you look at, let's say, the new, more renewable uh, sources and, and uses, uh, it's going more towards direct current. Uh, uh, solar farms are direct current. Uh, wind farms m quite often use a direct current intermediate stage uh, for the uh, to get it right on, on, on the mat. But also, when we look at all, all the sites like electric cars and data centers, uh, expecting to be huge consumers in, in, in the future, they are all work on direct current. So we had uh, one DSO. Um, they wanted to experiment on one location with direct current, 750 volts. Both, uh, you can take it from the net, but also give it back to the net. Um, and it was roughly, they had in mind, eight users, uh, one, mega, one megawatt in total. 
Then if you go and go to look at the legal points, uh, the Dutch electricity law doesn't speak about the recurrent or alternating current. They only talk about electricity. So actually, the electricity law allows both. But in the net code, it's much more detailed. Uh, and if you read it, it everywhere, it's, you, can, you can only use it for AC, uh, alternating current. All the requirements on, on net stability, on quality of the, of the, of the power, on the type of measurement, they're all based on AC um, alternating currents. So the net code itself was limiting. So um, since ACM has a derogation uh, power, uh, we looked into it. Um, first, we said maybe we should change the code since it's you know it's getting big and maybe everybody should be uh, able to do it. Uh, but still, the, that's of course too big at once. So then. Uh, DSOs would be uh, obliged to give DC, and of course that's that's not the right moment. So that's why we quite uh, came to a derogation uh, of the net codes. Um, it was possible. Uh, it's it's a specific case. It's only one case. Uh, it's temporary. It will be an experiment of nine years, after which it's uh, evaluated and decided on whether it will be bigger or just not working. Uh, and that's why at this moment we are uh, consulting our decision that we actually grant this derogation. Another example, um, the terrace. If you look, I show you now two graphs. The graph on top is uh, some random graph uh, taken from a random network where you see the power usage uh, during the day. Uh, the whole grid is made on the top, on the peak usage, which here is around 6 o'clock in the evening. And during night, there is uh, less usage of the network. On the other hand, if you look at the electricity prices, uh, they are the cheapest during the night. Think about wind farms. Uh, they are producing all the time, uh, but there is little uh, need for the electricity. So it would be, of course, very nice in thinking renewable, uh, using the, the, the power you have uh, efficiently to use this uh, as much electricity at night. Now, Holland is known from uh, the greenhouses, all the flowers uh, and vegetables we make in greenhouses, taking a lot of electricity. And of course, um, a plant or a flower, it doesn't really care whether it gets all the, uh, especially the light and heating at night or day. So it would be quite efficient to use all the electricity at night when it is cheap. It comes from renewable sources. But the problem is that our tariff structure is limiting that. Uh, the half of the, of the tariff is based on the peak usage uh, for every quarter hour interval. So that means if a greenhouse will use it at night, actually they will pay quite a lot, much more than they save uh, by using the cheap energy. That's why uh, one of the DSOs, uh, the one with where the most greenhouses are located, proposed a new system with some kind of traffic light system. Uh, it calculates how, how much space there is on, on the network. If there's enough, some greenhouses get green light to use more electricity without having to pay the peak for that. Uh, still, other DSOs, uh, we also said, now, it, it sounds like a good idea. Maybe everybody should uh, uh, use it. Uh, other DSO said, yeah, we don't know the exactly the effect. Maybe by gaming, uh, you know, we get less money at the end. And since our costs are constant, then we got problems. So also, this is uh, an experiment. Uh, it's temporary. It's for three years. It's specific. It's for one area on one specific um, energy level. Uh, and they are going to experiment in such a way to see whether it actually will work or that at the end maybe it's only used to cut costs but not giving any uh, advantage in the, in the use of renewable energy. Also, this one is on the cons consultation, uh, uh, but uh, ATM proposes in the consultation to actually grant this uh, uh, derogation. Uh, another example where we did not give the, uh, the derogation is a wind farm. Uh, it has such a capacity that it normally 
should have uh, be connected directly to the transformer from uh, which transforms to the 20 kilovolt. Uh, because if it would put on which we call the uh, medium tension ring, if it would fully uh, put its energy, no one else on that ring could use the ring. So actually, then it's taking up all the uh, common resources. Uh, but of course, the advantage of having a producer at the end of such a ring is that you feed in your energy from both sides. So it actually means that maybe at the end you can use the uh, the infrastructure, the rain in the ground more efficiently. So it sounds like a good experiment. So uh, we didn't have any problem with the experiment. But uh, the actually request for the derogation was that uh, because if you uh, put your um, connection on the rain, it's much cheaper than to put it directly on a transformer. So the request was not a request was not just to do the experiments, which you more or less allowed without any derogation but to have different tariffs. Um, now, then we concluded like uh, a lower tariff is not really needed for the experiment because it's a technical experiment and not a tariff-wise experiment. It also gives uh, discrimination uh, because then this wind farm pays less than a comparable wind farm, which actually is connected to the transformer according to the rules. So since it will give discrimination, which is forbidden by the energy law, which we cannot uh, supersede, uh, and it was not really needed for this uh, experiment, uh, we said, no, you don't get a derogation for this uh, experiment. That brings me to my last slide, because it's actually, I tell it quite quickly, but it are long processes. Uh, for instance, the direct current, uh, we already discussing it for two years, and we are all only now in the um, It's not something quickly. It, it's, it's some, the derivation was not really made for experiments. It was more made like uh, things you could not foresee when you decided on the net counts. So uh, the ministry is now uh, thinking and discussing a new law which would make it much easier. It's going, uh, we already have a law for experimenting, but it was not for the TSOs and DSOs. It was only for small groups wanting to experiment with uh, renewable energy. Uh, but since, yeah, if you look at the cost structure, uh, the TSOs and DSOs are roughly the half of the cost of the energy for uh, uh, if you, if you look at the whole nation. So it means if they can get more uh, efficient, it, it leads to lower prices. If they get more efficient, it means more people, or it's easier to use renewable energy. Um, but yeah, there was not a good uh, a law for them to uh, go directly, have a complete derogation. So what are we discussing now with the ministry? The ministry is discussing it with the market participants. Um, isn't, possibility for experiments for TSOs and DSOs. They should be aimed at the energy transition. Uh, it's the derogation for both the electricity law and the net codes at once. It's limited by the number of uh, uh, consumers and, and uh, uh, involved. Uh, they still didn't have a real number in mind, but you have to think about 10 to 100,000. And uh, there's only one um, place you have to go is the ministry. Is there, uh, uh, let's say, office where you also can get uh, subsidizing for the for the renewable energy? They also will handle those requests. So actually, the idea is that you even can combine the requests. You can get this uh, subsidizing plus you get the derogation from the applicable laws. Uh, but still, this is under discussion. Uh, of course, we're all in favor that it will be a good law. That, but of course, the, uh, it's also important, which I wanted to show with the previous case I, I presented, that it's not misused for, for instance, uh, not having sufficient protection for consumers or for just making things cheaper, which does not really add to the whole renewable energy uh, experimentation. So that's roughly my part. I think we skipped questions to the okay, Q&A. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh,
Albert for this presentation. So we will give now the floor to Carl. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Fernando. I think I hope everybody can hear me. Um, good afternoon, I guess, for almost everyone attending. Um, I'm going to talk about the Zintec program, Smart Energy Showcases, um, which is part of the digital agenda for the energy transition in Germany. Um, my name is Karl Wanninger. I'm working for Projekt Rio Jülich, which is a funding agency on behalf of um, the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, and we act as a program manager for this for this program, Zintec. So the brief motivation is, as always, the energy transition, and I just showed you the numbers, the targets until 2050, as stated in the German energy concept. I do not intend to go through all the numbers. There are three pillars. It's like climate, renewable energy, and energy efficiency. Maybe to pick out two of these points uh, showed there. Uh, in terms of energy efficiency, if we look at uh, the, the lowest part, where it is the, the final energy consumption in transport, the plan is to reduce it um, by a factor, or to increase it, to increase the efficiency by a factor of four within the next 30 years. And we see that uh, instead of that, it is still increasing slightly. So in terms of efficiency, there is still a lot to do. On the other hand, maybe a success story, we see in the second line the gross, gross electricity consumption. The share of renewables is at roughly 36%, which is well within the, the range for 2020, and even slightly above. So there is the, the success story of the energy transition. However, from this come from both of these come challenges. So the first challenge is, uh, of course, the energy efficiency, which will be a main tar target for the next time. But also for the success story, for the renewable energies, this poses its own prob uh, challenges. Namely, there is uh, first um, the, fl the, 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 the fluctuation in time, and on the other hand, the decentralized generation. And this rises the question on more flexibility in the energy system. And uh, the decentralization leads to, to the need for more data exchange and data measurement, and so to a whole digital transformation of the system alongside the energy transformation. And all this needs to happen in keeping the system stable all the time. The challenges have to be tackled on all possible solution layers. There is, of course, coming from a funding agency, is the technology layer, which it is necessary to bring new technology, to develop new technology, but to also integrate it into the system and to also have the possibility to integrate it into the market and also to integrate all the flexibility in the market in an efficient way. This in uh, using the terms of Fernando in the introduction would be the demonstration aspect, but you also have the regulation aspect, which is the next solution layer. In order to do so efficiently, there might be a necessity, necessity to adjust policy and regulation. And of course, you have to, um, it is necessary to, um, to raise the acceptance of society for this transition because otherwise it's hardly possible. And all these solution layers are intended to be tackled by the program Zintec. Um, so it's smart energy and it it's showcases. So the solutions, it is intended to show the solutions to, the, to society. To be more, more uh, um, concise, the objectives are to transform um, the system to smart networks, to connect generation, demand, storage, and the grid, to also to de develop solutions in, in the showcases, and to see where the common denominator of solutions is and how this 
common denominators can be put into blueprints in order to be used for a future integrated energy system, system and also in order to be used to, um, to, uh, to transfer them into mass markets. Um, it is also intended to implement the solutions in pilots and showcases. And the last point is um, to gather information on necessary adjustments for the regulatory framework by creating regulatory sandboxes. And for this reason, last year in June, the Syntec um, regulation came into effect, and it provides the partners in, in Syntec with uh, certain experimental options, um, which some in, uh, in some way tra transgress um, the certain regulations in the energy laws and acts currently in Germany. Um, so the showcase regions are distrib widely distributed over Germany. So, in, so all Germany is included in this in this program. There are five uh, showcase regions. They started their work in um, in the end of 2016 after one year of preparation and another year of evaluation and another year of and another time of even more preparation. And uh, the regions. The projects are, are accompanied by some research-focused projects. Um, there is, as a showcase, there is C cells in the south of Germany, designers in the west, Enera in the northwest, New 4.0 in the north, and Windnode in the east of Germany. So you see, all parts are covered, and um, the total funding in all of these projects is 200, around 200 million. And we are talking about 200 funded partners and an additional of 150 non-funded partners, so 300, over 300 partners from um, companies, universities, research centers, and, and also other stakeholders. And the companies also provide more than 300 million of own funding, so the total project costs are roughly about 500 million, which are put into this program. The central common aspect is to, yeah, to, to, to tackle the challenges that I mentioned before. So the system integration of renewable energies, the, um, ensuring uh, the system stability, to improve the energy efficiency to increase the flexibility of the, the energy systems to test the efficient rollout um, of intelligent measurement systems and to, to pave the way for the digital transformation, uh, but also to test new and innovative business models. <coughs> These are the common objectives, but still each of the showcases has their own uh, focal points. I will briefly go through them, but I am not going to go into detail because I think time is it's too less time for that. So the first one, Inera, is in, in, the, in the northwestern part of Lower Saxony. It's a relatively small region, and the region itself is the demonstration project. It, the, it's, um, it has a high share of renewables due to, to, to a lot of installed wind energy. And the objectives are to, um, to roll out um, thousands of smart meters, to implement a platform for smart data and services, to look for a, for a regional market for ancillary services, and overall to increase the flexibility of generators, loads, and storage. And they also want to include a lot of startups which, new, which develop new business models. Then we have in the north, we have um, new 4.0, 4 where uh, we have lots of generation from wind energy, but also with Hamburg, a large um, load centrum. And the objective is uh, roughly to, to find an, an, uh, a, a good way to demonstrate that it is possible to have a, a, a by 2025, to have a region where the supply is uh, fully uh, provided by a share of 70% of uh, renewable energies. And for this, they have to find ways to better export to other regions instead of um, 
curtailing and to better use the existing flexibility in the region. Then we have in the West um, designers where the region is, for, is, is um, a typical, typical for a region is the, the Ruhr Basin, which is a, lo a large load center, but also it's a region where a lot of um, where there's a lot of, 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 of coal and which might undergo large structural changes in the future. But you have also a lot, a lot of uh, wind generation in the rural, rural areas. And the objective here is to, um, one of the main objectives is to, to find a way to, to, um, to transfer the energy and data over different grid levels and to ensure um, a pr procedure which is independent of the grid levels to, to communicate and to transfer the, the energy. And also another main ob objective is to, to, to um, integrate um, other energy carriers like gas and heat. Um, in the south, the situation is a little bit different because there the main uh, renewable generation comes from PV rather than from wind energy. But still, uh, the idea is there to, uh, to look at a system which is organized cellularly and to find market mechanisms, regional market mechanisms, to, to look into regional market mechanisms, to use cloud-based data infrastructures to tackle the data and digitization problems, and to uh, treat the system as a whole as an integrated system with electric, electricity, heat, and transport. And uh, the fifth uh, region is in the east of Germany. It's actually the complete balancing zone of one of the PSO in Germany. And it's also characterized by a lot of uh, renewable generation in Brandenburg and in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, but also by a huge load center in Berlin. And so there it is also um, uh, uh, one of the uh, key goals to, uh, to build an ICT platform to connect all the stakeholders and also to, um, to find new ways for the common operation of TSO and DSO and to uh, integrate also the services and goods sector into the, into the system. So these were the demonstration aspects, as I said, and now the next one or the regulation aspects. Now, as a disclaimer, I am from a funding agency, so um, I'm afraid I will uh, only give a superficial introduction to this topic. And uh, I think my answers, uh, my answers to more detailed questions, will be rather disappointing. So, uh, this is a short disclaimer before. The Syntax regulation basis is based on experimenting options, and you can roughly categorize them in four categories. The first one is uh, the options given to the DSO, namely to create an internet platform for loads um, without engaging other DSOs, which is a deviation to the, the normal Energy Act, where this has to be uh, done coordinated and without discrimination for all the DSOs. The second would concern the, the uh, generation of electricity. And here, the regulation allows to, to, um, to switch to an additional load uh, if the generation of the, um, of, uh, if the generation would be otherwise curtailed. Then, of course, uh, the generator does not get any compensation for the curtailment, but the compensation comes from the from the um, from the net operator up to the grid operator up to the to this curtailment compensation. The third base is, uh, the third point is the concerns the customers. Their um, reimbursements are possible if uh, there are losses from uh, from from um, Higher, um, from higher network tariffs. For instance, if in the time of the project, 
it is necessary to to generate additional load peaks, which would increase the uh, the annual the annual maximum demand, uh, which would increase the annual uh, the the maximum maximal annual load peak, which would lead to a higher to a higher uh, net tariff. Also, if in time of project um, um, there is necessary to withdraw powers in times of high load, or if uh, the load is used in less time, which could also be a disadvantage because you don't get a bonus for for the higher usage time. And the fourth point would uh, concern the storage and power to X conversion, where there are um, various kind of reimbursement, which um, with respect to various um, energy acts and energy laws, <coughs> which I cannot go into detail. And also, it is possible to get a reimbursement of 60% of, of the EG, EG apportionment. Um, so these are the experimenting options which are uh, presented with this regulation. They also have, of course, limitations. And the limitations are it's only for participants in Zintec, which has to be document, documented, and uh, the funding agency, so we are testing the participant status. It is only valid for the duration of Zintec, and it is only for demonstration purposes. And also, now the uh, further limitations, the rules and the deviations are only valid if two conditions hold. The first one is um, the measures are taken to serve to stabilize the grid or to avoid grid congestion. congestion. And the second uh, is um, the, the, the price um, at the exchange has to be zero or negative for electricity. And this is the point because the purpose of the regulation is strictly to compensate or to compensate partly these advantages from demonstrating solutions in Syntec. And also to do this uh, and carefully uh, respect European subsidy law. And to do that, the first step is the participants have to pay all considerations and apportionments beforehand. The second step, they would apply to the regulator, the Bundesnetzagentur in Germany, for the reimbursement of the additional project-related costs covered by the experimental options. And also important with view to the um, to subsidy um, law because um, you have on the other hand, on the one hand, you have the compensations now, and on the other hand, you have the the project funding, and so all profits have to be deducted from these costs prior to reimbursement. So that was the point, the point uh, about the regulation, and finally, uh, also very important because this is an international webinar, and it is an important aspect for Zintec to to um, to build up collaborations with partners from other countries. And this could be by exchange information on project results or on project itself, like we do now, or to create networks, or to do common workshops and transversal topics, like standardization, which is an important issue. And last but not least, to support collaboration of international, international and German partners in funded projects. And Michael Hübner, who is the coordinator of the ERANET Smart Energy Systems, mentioned it. It is uh, one way to do that is, of course, by initiating bilateral projects. But another way is to build on existing frames like the ERANET Smart Energy Systems, where many partners, if you see the, the map, almost all of Western Europe is coll collaborating. And there are already a lot of, state, uh, of calls put up, and um, there will be more calls. And so based on the results, for instance, from Zintec, but also from, the, from other R&D projects, one can uh, initiate uh, efficiently international collaboration. So I think this was my last slide. And, uh, Thank you for your attention.